From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. U.S. soldiers in Europe get pwned by their flashcard apps. Norton wants you to help mine crypto. And hang on to your hot dog weenies. The JBS cyber attack might affect your July the 4th barbecue. Now, these are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you this week on the Cybersecurity Headlines podcast. And now we're going to get a chance for some insight, some opinion and some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, who this week is Brian Zimmer, head of security at Humu. Hey, Steve, thank you. I think that's probably the most enthusiastic applause I've ever received. They're good people, I tell you. Our studio audience, they wait all week just to do that. Then they go back to sleep for a while, but they are wonderful people. So welcome to the show. Our show this week is sponsored by Reversing Labs. I'll be speaking about them shortly as well. And if you are joining us live, uh, please join us on Crowdcast and enjoy the show and add your comments. And perhaps we can uh, refer to a few of those comments as we go through our show today. So we just have 20 minutes to cover a bunch of stories that have been making the news this week. And let's start, Brian, with the first one. This is Google, a lawsuit that is revealing that uh, Google made it nearly impossible for users to keep their locations private. These are unredacted documents in a lawsuit uh, brought forth by the Arizona Attorney General's office last year. Executives and engineers knew just how difficult the company had made it for smartphone users to keep their location data private, and even were getting um, companies like LG to make it difficult to do this. So this is part of this ongoing lawsuit. Many, I think, that Google has to face like all large companies do, but... You know, is this a, an example of a company that is being has become too big to sue successfully, Brian? Uh, well, I, w- I wouldn't say that. I mean, this is America, land of the free, home of the lawsuit. Um, but to be successful, you might have to head over to the EU where they've had a bit more success with uh, regulating and suing tech companies. Um, so I would say everyone's gut reaction to this kind of, uh, they're like, oh, this proves again that Google's evil through and through. But I'm I'm kind of a benef- benefit of the doubt sort of guy. So it's I don't think it's so cut and dry. I mean, it does show that some employees were trying to do the right thing. Uh, I know there were and hopefully still are uh, good people on their privacy treat privacy team trying to fight the good fight. Um, after all, it's where the, the model build with respect came from, which is the idea that privacy and security should be built into products in the beginning, you know, like from the hardware on up to the human. And I think that there's definitely a, a large UX or user experience component to this because um, even their own employees didn't know how the privacy settings interacted and worked. So, you know, companies need to put the user's privacy first and then make sure that those features are simple and uh, simple to understand and easy to use. And also the settings should default to private so that but, um, you know, of course, it's going to be at the potential expense of the, you know, the company's profits and add a slight bit of inconvenience for the user. But I think users these days finally are to the point where they're like, OK, I don't mind clicking a pop up that says, are you OK with app X, Y, Z tracking your location and viewing your photos versus that being the hidden default? Uh, I mean, users are, are tired of their data being leaked. And so companies are finally starting to do something about it. That is the issue, I think, is that they do uh, users, the public are seeing more and more of these leaks happening. So I think that it's not just Google, of course. I mean, they're all competing competing for this kind of access. I know we've covered some stories about Microsoft uh, and the the Edge browser this week as well, but I guess that's part of the quid pro quo for using this technology essentially essentially for free. Exactly. Now, here's one that I should, I think is going to interest you. Of course, this is about the uh, the US soldiers in Europe who exposed uh, some uh, nuclear weapon secrets by way of their flashcard apps. These are really cool apps in the sense of what they do in terms of training uh, the soldiers in things such as where the shelters are, where the hot vaults, where the nuclear weapons, as well as uh, security details and protocols like the positions of cameras and patrols around the vaults and so forth. So a lot of good stuff on these flashcards. But it seems that some of these were findable since way back to 2013. It's the uh, the journalism group uh, Bellingcat who found this out, contacted NATO and the U.S. military. So I guess here I want to leave this open, given your experience in this area. Uh, what do you think about our reliance on things like flashcards? Once again, a piece of data up there, out there, uh, and findable. Are you saying I have experience with flashcards or nuclear codes? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully both. <laughs> So um, I think this is just a classic case of uh, users trying to get their job done and, you know, inadvertently subverting millions of dollars of uh, security controls. I mean, it happens at small companies, big companies, the government, of course. So um, as we all know, people are are like water. You put a, a rock 
blocking their way to get their job done, and they're just going to find a way around it. So uh, I think if if these soldiers had an approved technical solution for their flashcards and had a w- or had a way of getting a new one approved that wouldn't take an act of Congress, um, I think this data wouldn't have been leaked. Um, I mean, I suppose it's possible that they had put this in um, in an authorized solution, but it was, you know, misconfigured. Um, that's, suppose that's an option. And some people might be saying, you know, hey, well, why don't you just use three by five cards and a pencil like I used to? And I say, well, yeah, you know, you can do that. But are we also going to go back to typewriters then and stop using email? So it's the modern day and we have to, you know, accept some risk, some risk with technology. Um, you know, if the, if the technology is going to be too frustrating, people just aren't going to use it and find a, a new solution. And of course, it's, as we know, it's very hard to resist the urge to use the new shiny solution your coworker found. It's like, hey, I got this new thing it's cool we should totally use this it made my job easier so um just it, this happens the world over and i have to say it's one this is one of my favorite stories of people uh subverting security to get their job done uh, it's right up there with the story from uh the the nike missiles uh the nuclear codes to launch those things were set to all zeros for a number of years oh that's that's comforting yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> people uh, do, as you said, they need to have the access to things. And I mean, there's a lot of good to be said for things such as flashcards, especially if they have some sort of iterative uh, procedure in which, as you answer them, they get harder. I think that the, the net result, the net benefit is uh, much better than the old 3 by 5 cards. But I think it's always that thing we always have in the back of our mind is there's always a little piece of weakness somewhere that somebody is going to find. So it's intriguing and it's also quite, again, a bit of an exciting story just in the sense of it being new nuclear codes. It's just uh, it's a little bit more than, than the hot dogs and, and, and so forth that other people are getting breached on. So let's go to open source. Have I been pwned, which again is a very interesting to me product or service or contest, if you'd like, having gone from just that from a contest and now being a, largely a world leader in innovation. So the uh, Breach Database Service has now gone open source with their code hosted on GitHub. And um, I find this one to be something that's worthy of our show because they've also been uh, um, uh, promised some of the compromised passwords that the FBI had discovered recently. Uh, putting these things together, the have I been pwned, GitHub, and compromised passwords, it kind of makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I'm just wondering, am I just being a little bit too hypersensitive here? Uh, well, you know, a healthy dose of paranoia is, is good. I mean, I think there's controls and they're not going to be, well, in theory, they're not going to be checking those, those, uh, passwords into, into GitHub, uh, mainly just the source code. But first I have to say that, um, I really think Troy should get some sort of security saint award because, you know, he's been providing this highly valuable service for individuals and companies for years for free. Um, so he's just made a, a, a huge, uh, contribution to security and definitely needs to be recognized for it. So, um, but Back to the topic. So I, I don't think it's a huge risk. I mean, because as far as I can tell, it's just the FBI feeding information to, um, you know, to have I been pwned. So in theory, it's a good thing because they'll get a, a, some good intel from the FBI. Of course, you know, it's going to be slightly stale and uh, and filtered because they don't want to affect active investigations, things like that. Um, but if the S- FBI starts getting their hands, say, behind the scenes in the app, um, you know, that I might be you know, or changing project priorities or adding and removing features, um, not in the the publicly viewable GitHub version. Um, I might be a little more concerned there. So, you know, people could, of course, fork their own version, do their own thing. But uh, most people are going to keep using the main version just because it's it's easier for them. It just seems to me, again, that the transfer of information to these kinds of repositories, I'm hoping for the best, obviously. But just like the flashcard story, uh, maybe the lesson to take from this, again, is just to keep, you know, sleep with both eyes open if possible, because these are where these mistakes tend to be made. And I mean, I have greatest respect for GitHub as well. It's just... Uh, these kinds of things combining always seems to be the the, the potential for problems. But let's now talk about food. Uh, We had, as one of our biggest stories, not only us, of course, but all around the the mainstream media as well, was that uh, there was a cyber attack on JBS Foods, which uh, forced uh, them to shut down operations in the US and Australia, which apparently is quite a substantial portion of the supply chain of food. Uh, This was, uh, I think, just today, I think we're covering it tomorrow's, uh, in tomorrow's newscast, that it was our evil, Revil, behind this, the Russian organization. But they did go to the White House to talk about this, that the ransom demand came likely from a place in Russia. And the White House is engaging in this, especially in light of the upcoming summit talks. So it's more than just simply hot dogs and steaks here. We're talking about another 
poke at the supply chain. And uh, other stories we've covered this week, including the, the New York City subway and Nantucket steamship lines, we seem to be doing this every week now, significant supply chain attacks. So what are your thoughts about this, this growing, or is it a growing thing, or are we just simply covering it more? So I think this one's obviously an attack by uh, foreign state-sponsored vegetarian hackers, uh, and it's tied to the Colonial Pipeline. Uh, and how do I know that? Because there's nothing more American than grilling hamburgers, and lots of Americans need uh, propane to do said grilling. So you take a country that wants to crush America's spirit, you find some hackers that happen to be vegetarians, you put them together, and it's a recipe for disaster. Um, and what's more American than grilling hamburgers is apple pie and baseball. So the MLB and companies in the apple pie supply chain should be on notice. Uh, just be careful out there. You're probably next. But really, uh, the, this is just another example of people and companies and entire industries not focusing on security because they don't think it's going to affect them. They're like, oh, we just make meat. We bring tasty happiness to people. Why should anyone attack us? Um, it's just like you know, a bunch of years back with the media industry before the Sony attacks uh, by North Korea. They thought, oh, we're just making movies. We're making people happy. Uh, no one's going to attack us. And we all know how that ended. So. Um, it's just an example of one mo one major incident can f finally get an entire industry to care about about the attacks. I'm hoping that we're as an industry we'll be able to t help the public see how these things do tie together and that no no company is too small or too irrelevant to be the point of entry uh, for attack. So perhaps we can think about that as we have our uh, vegetarian weenies on July the 4th. So our sponsor for this week is Reversing Labs. Reversing Labs. Recent supply chain attacks and executive orders have left thousands scrambling for guidance. So we invite you to join Reversing Labs as they take their exclusive supply chain roadshow to your local region virtually. You will be able to hear from AppSec specialists and security execs as they discuss lessons learned and innovative approaches that will move your supply chain security and compliance program forward. Very timely advice. So for more information, please go and visit them at reversinglabs.com. Brian. LinkedIn is showing us that Austin, Texas, is the biggest winner in tech migration. This is uh, just a recent story that's just come out, and uh, it's talking about people who are actually moving away from Silicon Valley. Um, 217 software information technology company workers per every 10,000 in Austin, uh, followed by Nashville, Charlotte, Jacksonville, and Denver as the most attractive places to work now in high tech. So perhaps this is the new era of work, the concept of the distributed teams, for example, with people moving and living in different places, growing the economies of local towns while still being able to work for large organizations. So do you think this uh, is something that uh, is going to be a trend that will continue past the return to the new normal? And also, are you seeing this at Humu? Are you seeing this locally in your own specific backyard? I mean, I hope it continues to be a trend because uh, it definitely has improved a lot of people's lives. Um, we, we have definitely seen that at Humu where people have, um, you know, we still have the, the core group in, in California, but some people have kind of distributed themselves around the company or around the country and uh, it's, it's working out. I mean, it, I guess it all depends on, on each team's or each company's executive leadership. Like you probably saw in the news today that, that Apple wants people to come back three days a week soon. So, but that's, that's a good step. You know, that's kind of like a halfway point. So that's, that's nice. Um, and I mean, I've had several friends leave Silicon Valley for, you know, Austin and Idaho and Tennessee, because I mean, you got cheaper living, you got a slower pace of life, bigger houses, all that sort of stuff. So I would just be aware that, that I've heard that there is some reluctance of, of the locals there. They're, you know, the quote unquote evil Californians coming in with their quote unquote California politics and all that sort of stuff, changing the culture, driving the cost of housing up and crowding them out. So just remember to tread lightly. You're not in Kansas anymore. And, uh, you know, you might like the stars at night in yeah it's but you're totally right i mean it, it is uh, it is a new trend it, we're seeing i i'm seeing personally uh, every day in the mainstream media wall street journal and and forbes and things like that stories either pro or con this half of them are saying everyone's got to come back to work and the other half are saying no this is the new thing so it is interesting to see and and uh, uh so you said you're seeing some of this at humu as well yeah and uh it's it's working out fine for us so we were going to continue to keep the uh, the doors open so to speak for remote hiring 
Cool. Okay. Well, while they are there, wherever they happen to be working, they want to watch out for the next thing, which of course is happening, as we would expect. The back to work spear phishing campaigns have begun. And uh, Cofence Phishing Defense brought this story to light, but I think it's pretty normal and expectable. The phishing campaigns are now aimed at employees who are now gathering themselves back to work, whether it's physically back to the office or just more to a work mindset. Uh, emails, for example, coming from what seems to be the CIO, Chief Information Officer with the uh, information about changes to business operations, exactly the same thing as a year ago when they were sending out things about COVID-19 hygiene. So it's the same story, really, and uh, we're going to see more and more of these. So do you have any suggestions as to how we can get people to stop falling for this? We, I ask this question a lot, and what can we do to get people to stop falling for this obvious fish? Uh, we can get rid of email, I guess. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's just playing with with human psychology. I mean, there's always going to be a, it's attacking the human. I mean, you can maybe you can't get through the technical controls, but you you can always go through the person because people are typically fairly trusting. Um, so you know, with a technical control, you could set up you know get yourself a good email filter and then turn on two factor authentication everywhere. That's that's my biggest recommendation. Um, next would be of course. Uh, educating your users, you know, with real copies of real world examples of phishing attacks like this one, for example, so they can see, you know, oh, here's something that happened. And then after the attack, here's the chain of things that happened. So this is why we should care about this. Um, and remember, if you're going to do the more traditional phishing education where you have people, you know, it, you send out some fake emails and then they click on it and you go, ha ha, I got you. Um, people definitely, <laughs> you got to be careful with that because you can get a huge black eye at your company and, and burn a lot of goodwill. Um, I've, I mean, I've heard stories about, uh, you know, somebody getting, you know, feeling scorned and then going to executive management and coming down pretty hard on the security company or on the security team. So um, I recommend uh, being careful there and then get, getting yourself a good email filter and turning on 2FA. Those are the strongest recommendations right now. Yeah, uh, we have covered a few stories like that that have had a significant backlash when uh, the good intentions of IT have been really uh, not well received by those who got caught in the phishing. But this is part of digital literacy is learning. I mean, I think 2FA is definitely the way to go, but even that, it gets some bad press once in a while as being too, too annoying and too difficult. So an ongoing problem but let's take things outside for a moment here. We've got a story about uh, the, the uh, DJI drones that are now good enough for the government. According to a Pentagon report summary, um, DJI drones that have been built for the government have been cleared for use by the P Pentagon with uh, an audit finding no malicious code or intent. Uh, this was following a grounding of drones a couple of years ago uh, because of thoughts about uh, sharing data with the Chinese government. So once again, I'm coming back around to a sort of a discomforting combination of things that we've got here, the use of drones, of course, which are still being used a lot and have been used for years. But another story came up this week is about the first, the first battlefield killing by an autonomous drone. Uh, one that thinks for itself and decides what's it going to, what it's going to do and actually did commit a fatality uh, intentionally by doing that. And then we've got the flashcard story of earlier this evening and of the ongoing solar winds issue. So there's once again this notion of machines, robots running free, running wild uh, with questionable security or again, prone for exploitation. So do you have concerns about uh, how these drones are being deployed with these kinds of things in context? Uh, I mean, I for one welcome our robot overlords as long as they don't <laughs> shoot me. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, they're going to decide that. So Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, if we're worried about, you know, these authorized drones for, and, or, uh, you know, the, the autonomous drones, that kind of stuff. I mean, really, they're, if you're worried about the the autonomous drones getting hacked, it's like, really, they're going to kill people either way. Do you want them to kill, or kill based on the decisions of the, the guy that bought it or, you know, the person that hacked it? So it's really which, which country is pulling or not uh, pulling trigger, but, you know, hitting the button that says, please go do some bad stuff over here. Um, so, but I mean, as far as the, these drones being authorized, the DJI drones, I, I mean, distrust of foreign products has been going on for, in the US government for a long time. It's, it's nothing new. Uh, some of it's justified by actual attacks and some of it's just, they don't want it to happen again, even if there is no particular threat in, for this, that use case. So, I mean, it includes computers, applications, network hardware, hi Huawei, uh, and drones, <laughs> you know, drones now. So, um, yeah, the report says that the DOD audited these drones, but I, but even if they're approved, um, just because a point in time audit didn't find malicious code or activity doesn't mean it couldn't be inserted later by, you know, DJI or China or right. attackers or somebody. Yep. So, um, you know, or, um, you know, the drone operators could just choose not to update the firmware, but 
that's not a hundred percent solution. So anyway, these, um, these two drone models are more trusted than before, but, uh, I doubt they'd still be trusted for, you know, be completely trusted or trusted for all use cases. There's always going to be risks involved. It's, uh, as uh, we've comment, we just got online here. It's like Robocop. We're living the Robocop life here. This is, uh, uh, and we also got another comment here from John about JBS saying the attack was well done and not rare. So let's rim shot that one. I need to get a rim shot sound effect. Very nicely done. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> indeed. So last story, is, we've, we've done our 20 minutes already. It's amazing how fast this goes by. Just a real quick answer on this one, if you will. Uh, Norton 360 antivirus is now letting you mine crypto as part of its solution because... They can. So this is an interesting idea on just simply being uh, what we used to think of just simply as a security company is now letting you do some um, uh, Ethereum mining, which is going to be stored in cloud hosted Norton wallet. So what do you think? Is this a good move for Norton? Just simply progress or uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, I don't mean to insult the uh, the team over there, but I think this is crazy pants. Uh, I have no idea why you would why you would do this at all. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the uh, adding this to any virus product just makes no sense. Although, unless you're trying to uh, make an, make some extra profit, or you want to seem hit by riding the crypto bandwagon, I mean, it's kind of like adding a margarita machine and racing stripes to a minivan. It's straight out of pimp my ride, and I'm sure Exhibit would be proud. Um, so, you know, maybe the next thing you know, they're going to start selling NFTs. Uh, that would be good. Uh, that would be interesting. So we'll cover that for the next time. Uh, very. Cool. So you know what? We are done. I'm just wondering out of the stories that we've covered here, did you have any one of them that is a particular interest, either an eye roller or a thumbs up good story? Anything that uh, you liked from today's session? Uh, well, I was going to say the meat one because meat is near and dear to my heart, but um, I'm going to go with the uh, the nuclear flashcard stuff. That's a, that's a fun one. I remember that one. Well, let's, again, discuss this over burgers on July the 4th, if we can. Brian Zimmer, head of security at Humo, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you. Thank you so much for being with us on our show today. Thank you. Oh, by the way, where do you want people to find you? What's a good place for them to contact you? I'm in security. You can't find me. No, just, okay. Uh, LinkedIn is never here. LinkedIn is the best way. Uh, I don't really do Twitter much. I'm I'm too lazy. So yeah, find me on LinkedIn. Happy to talk. Uh, mentor, provide random ideas. Uh, pick my brain. Whatever you do, whatever whatever helps. Fantastic, Brian. Thank you. It's B R Y A N Zimmer, by the way. So thank you so much, Brian, for being with us today. I also want to thank our sponsor, Reversing Labs, for their help in putting this show together. And remember, we have another video chat tomorrow, Friday, June the fourth. It is hacking DLP, data loss prevention. How we can manage data loss when everybody is working from home. That's going to be an excellent uh, conversation along with, again, the speed networking that happens afterwards. So remember, if you need some more information from us, you can join us every day of the week on the Cybersecurity Headlines podcast, six minutes or so of the stuff you need to know about in order to make your day as informed as possible. I'll be back next week. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Stay safe. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.